Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to be looking at Elizabeth I's government and this is part of my series on the Tudors uh, aimed at people studying A-level uh, history, in particular the AQA unit, uh, the Tudors 1C. So uh, government is really important. It overlaps with a, with a lot of the other bits that we're going to be looking at. There's also a kind of a, a shorter video on Elizabeth government that was made by a colleague of mine a couple of years ago, which is uh, also on the channel. So let's have a, a look at what the specification says. Well, the specification says we need to be able to answer the big question, in what ways and how effectively was England governed during this period? And, and particularly on Elizabeth's government, it says the Elizabethan government, the court, ministers and parliament, factional rivalries. So we're going to look at each one of those kind of component bits from the bullet point and, and overall to try and get a, a kind of sense of, of how good a job government was doing during the reign of Elizabeth I. And, and there are a couple of other debates that come in there. We're going to talk about this idea about whether there was a purist inquire in Parliament. Um, we're going to think about how well or otherwise Elizabeth was served by her ministers. And, and we're going to think about whether there was kind of a a kind of a period where Elizabethan government was good and then uh, whether it was a, a really a matter of decline in the last uh, 15 years or so of her reign. So let's take a look at the royal court. Well one of the important bits to remember about this is not court as in a legal court where, where judgments are made and things like this. Uh, and probably the easiest way of thinking about the court was, was the, the monarch's home. So the court is actually just wherever the monarch is. It's, it's not a, a particular place, it's not a particular building. It, it, it is a movable feast and it involved things like feasts. So it, it's where a lot of the informal bits of government take place. Um, the, in the summer months, the, the, the monarch would go on progress and they would, would travel around normally the south and, and the Midlands of, uh, count, Midland counties of England. And they'd take these great retinues of courtiers and stuff with it. They would, so there were courtiers, officials, servants. Uh, people kind of interacted between the different bits. So it was the centre of government. It linked to the various kind of more formal structures of, of local and national government. Um, it was the big arena where, where people kind of competed um, for royal favour. This is where you caught the Queen's eye. And, and uh, for example, one of the ministers we'll look at uh, later is Hatton. And, and, and that's what Hatton does. He catches the Queen's eye. And this, this leads him into all kinds of high points of government, mainly because he was really good at dancing. Um, it was an in instrument of propaganda. It, it showed the kind of cultural power, the, 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 the majesty, the, the, the wealth of a, a monarch, uh, and, and it was there to kind of impress, really. Um, it housed the councillors and chief ministers, and, and we often will see that there were people who were kind of courtiers first and then ministers later, and that those who were kind of ministers first, politicians first, and, and courtiers later. So, for example, Two of the famous, two, two most famous figures in Elizabeth's government are Robert Dudley and, and, and William Cecil. And, and Cecil's very much a kind of a, a career politician minister first and, and, and becomes a courtier, whilst Dudley's very much a, a courtier who kind of becomes a, a, a minister and, 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 and more serious kind of politician. So the, the court is the, the point of contact between the monarch and the governing class. Um, and it's also where the foreign ambassadors would meet the, the, the monarch and, and, and meet with other people of power. So the court in itself is, is a really important thing. And a lot, again, it's one of the bits that's really hard to pin down in a history lesson many years later, because I say a lot of this stuff is undocumented. A lot of the stuff that would go on would be chat in a corridor, a, um, a conversation over a meal, uh, a... a uh, some ideas thrashed out whilst hunting or uh, watching some other entertainments uh, and, and uh, it would have all the kind of the cliques or as we're going to look at it a bit later in the video factions that you would ex expect where you've got a large group of people to kind of jockey in position so it, again it'd be really interesting to be able to go back and sample but it, it's 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 harder to explain its role in government compared to say a parliament or a council which, which you can see them making kind of clear decisions and, and lines of authority and things like that the court it, it, it's more difficult to pin down than that and what we, we would see at court uh, is a big change under elizabeth really because um 
Tudor courts were set up really for a male monarch, for a king. And those of you who've studied the, the, the Henrys and, and looked at that, you'll again, particularly under Henry VIII, you'll know the importance of the office of groom of the stool, who um, controlled the privy chamber. But obviously now you don't have any men in the privy chamber because it's the privy chamber of the queen. Um, so the female attendants replaced the male ones, uh, and these become the ladies of the bedchamber. Uh, and they served only the Queen's personal needs. They didn't become, we don't believe, as, as involved in administrative or financial activities as the groom and stall and the gentleman of the Privy Chamber would have done under Henry VIII or Henry VII. Um, Graves argues that Elizabeth used the court as an, uh, effectively to woo a male governing class and wed it to her service. Uh, and so, Again, this gives us the idea of the imagery of the court, the idea of, of the, the personal interactions and essentially that what Elizabeth was doing was constantly winning over um, those of her realm, the powerful people of her realm to make sure they did what she wanted them to do. And she she was largely doing that in a kind of this slightly, this, in this mechanism, this court, this kind of an open field of, 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 of little bits of negotiation, a little bit of talk here, kind of a bit of pomp and ceremony of winning people round. I mean, there's lots of stuff and suggestions of the kind of Elizabeth flirting with various the courtiers and, and, and that would play into Graves' argument about this idea of wooing. Um, so Elizabeth's court was a very kind of educated and cultivated place. Um, and and the visitors from from both in England and from abroad were impressed by the quality of music and performers and composers employed by Elizabeth, uh, as well as by her own composing of music and dancing. So Elizabeth, again, we all know, is an incredibly accomplished and intelligent woman. Uh, the court appealed to the self-indulgent accommodation, staving, food and drink were, were available. So it was a very kind of grand and, and wonderful place to be, I imagine. Um, and, and the court was an avenue, an avenue for royal patronage. So this is where you could win favour with the, the monarch and, and therefore uh, receive the benefits of being in royal favour. We're now going to move on and look at some of the ministers. Now, the kind of the big overarching uh, question normally around the ministers is, is whether they served uh, Elizabeth well, whether they served her, whether they served their own interests. Um, whether they they led or whether they followed, so a lot of this we can fight, kind of fit in with that. William Cecil is is arguably the most important uh, minister under Elizabeth. So he had a, a service, a, a, a history and service beforehand. Um, so he'd served under Somerset. Um, he, uh, he 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 kind of seems to fall as Cecil uh, as Somerset fell, but then he managed to gain Northumberland's favour spending a very short period of time in the tower. Uh, it became a Secretary of State under Edward. Um, he resisted the device for a while, but uh, uh, under Edward's compulsion signed it. He then lost his position in, in Mary's reign. He ever managed to keep himself safe because he had no part in the divorce of Catherine of Aragon and, was, uh, and conformed, at least outwardly, to Catholicism whilst Mary was on the throne. Obviously, we, we know Later on, Cecil was a, a very kind of convinced radical Protestant, um, more radical possibly than, than Elizabeth, we, we think. Uh, he becomes one of the key ministers at the beginning of her reign, was made, made Secretary of State in 1558. And he came to dominate um, the council. The Spanish ambassador referred to Cecil as the man who does everything. He was a, a very simple man. He, he, I mean, in the picture above me, he's in his robes. I mean, he became Lord Burley later on, but he... Um, he generally dressed very plainly in black. He, he, he was seen as being quite humble. He was fiercely um, loyal to the Queen, uh, on whom he completely uh, doted. Uh, he, he shared a lot of her um, kind of political uh, leanings in a way. I mean, he was, again, reluctant to, to do enormous amounts of e e economic or financial reform, but he was very, very careful with money. Um, he can push Elizabeth in some areas, so he was far more in favour of um, intervention to help foreign Protestants than Elizabeth was. And we see, we see him pushing with, for example, intervention in Scotland. Uh, he he managed Parliament. He, he had a seat in the House of Lords when he became Lord Burley, 
Um, he, 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 in this, he sometimes, whenever there was areas where he couldn't persuade Elizabeth, there's a belief that he kind of used his influence in Parliament to push people to push her on things, issues like marriage and things like that. Uh, and religious reform, or again, we think Cecil was was more radically Protestant than Elizabeth. There has been periods where people have, have, have looked at Elizabeth's government being, being really Cecil's government, that, that he he was, as the Spanish ambassador put it, the man who did everything. I, I think really he, he was a generally very good and loyal servant of Elizabeth. You could tell the level of affection uh, she had for him as, well, in his uh, old age. First of all, she wouldn't let him retire because he was the man she couldn't be without. Uh, and then when he was... Um, very old and very ill she would go and feed him soup of her own recipe uh, and, uh, and again essentially nurse him so we we can see this as a um a really kind of compliment to, to Cecil and a real in, indication of just how important he was to Elizabeth so William Cecil I would say undoubtedly served Elizabeth well um he helped keep uh, finances um, on, on, in relatively good terms, despite the the, the drains, for example, um, with, with the the war with Spain, uh, he um, he was loyal to to an absolute fault. Uh, he, he was involved in some kind of little bits of double dealing and 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 some bits of factionalism, but overall, I would say he was a kind of very loyal servant of Elizabeth and someone who politically was very very close to her. One of um, my big favourites from this, uh, this period is uh, Robert Dudley, who um, my students will tell you I have to refer to as just Dudders. Um, so Robert Dudley becomes uh, the Earl of Leicester. He, again, his family uh, origins are absolutely um, fascinating. The Dudley family it, it is a really interesting one. So obviously he is um, the, the son of the, the Duke of Northumberland. Uh, the brother of Guilford Dudley, who met the uh, therefore the brother-in-law of uh, Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen, uh, and he ends up in uh, in in the Tower following the failure of the device, uh, which his fa his father was seen to be behind. He sees his father, his brother, and his sister-in-law all executed. We believe that when he was in the Tower at this point. He may well have met Elizabeth. Um, it, he was released in 1554. Elizabeth had been sent um, to the Tower to, to, to I believe she'd been involved in Wyatt's Rebellion. Um, on, on Elizabeth's accession to the throne, Dudley was appointed Master of the Horse. This was an important position at court. Um, and it meant that he was in very close attendance of the Sovereign. Uh, again, a Spanish ambassador reported that Dudley was one of the three persons who ran the country. And there was always these um, hot rumours about Dudley and Elizabeth. Were they more than just friends? Again, it's, it's impossible for us to absolutely know. But there's always there was always hot rumour around court that there was something going on. Um, this reached absolute fever, fever pitch uh, when Dudley's uh, wife, Amy Dudley, was found dead at the bottom of her stairs in slightly suspicious circumstances in 1560. Uh, Dudley was cleared uh, of any uh, involvement, um, but the, the kind of this, the, any chance, realistic chance of Dudley marrying Elizabeth were, were kind of destroyed by the, the, the scandal around us, the, the, that it, it, it seemed that Dudley had, had paved the way to um, be able to marry the Queen. Um, so if the Queen ever then did marry him, then th these rumours would re-emerge. They remained very close, however, after a, a, a brief kind of period where when the scandal was its height, when they, they were kept, he was kept very much at arm's length. In 62, the Queen fell ill with smallpox. Uh, believing her life to be in danger, she asked the Privy Council to make Robert Dudley uh, protector of the realm uh, and give him a suitable title with, with £20,000 a year income. Um, and and it, it didn't come to pass. He, he didn't need to take over and, and rule. She didn't because she didn't die. She she recovered her health. Dudley was made a, a privy councillor. Um, 
In 63, Elizabeth uh, suggested that Dudley should be married to Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, uh, and, and then this did, doesn't happen, but Dudley's made Earl of Leicester uh, and, and in an attempt to make him more acceptable to Mary. Um, Mary, Queen of Scots, seems that she might she might have accepted the proposal. However, Dudley wasn't willing to comply again. Some suggested the 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 this was partly because of uh his desire to kind of ultimately marry elizabeth um he he was a, a center of factionalism in the court so there's an idea of disagreement between him and cecil though the only real area of disagreement between him and cecil seems to be about who should marry elizabeth um they both agreed that she should marry i think just there was a, a strong hint that dudley thinks she should have married him uh, while Cecil absolutely thought Dudley was um, w was beneath her, he he was known for his Dudley was known for his charm and his good looks. Often referred to um, as the gypsy in reflection to his um, to to his looks, uh, and he he was a divisive figure. But but again, very very loyal to Elizabeth. Um, Yes, they had their ups and their downs. There's, there's a bit where he um, objects to Elizabeth's flirtation with other uh, male members of court, to which uh, Elizabeth um, gives him a flea in his ear and sends him uh, on his way, saying that she essentially she won't be told how to how to behave, that it was her court and she'd have no no master. He um, again failed, uh, he, he again favoured uh, intervention to help foreign Protestants in France, in the Netherlands. Um, he's really important in, in connections to the succession. Again, we believe that he is more religiously Protestant, more, more towards the Puritan end of Protestantism than Elizabeth. And again, there may have been a little bit of tension there. We see the rivalry with Norfolk in the 1560s. So th there's lots of stuff around Dudley. He does ultimately fail Elizabeth, in, 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 but not through lack of trying. So he's given um, a military uh, leadership in, in the Netherlands in 1585. Um, the, the, his campaign in, in the Netherlands uh, proves to be an absolute um, disaster, and he dies in, following this in 1588. And Elizabeth is... is, is um, very much at a loss without him. I, he, we, we see um, they are devoted to each other, again, whether this is just friendship or something more. But again, I would argue that <clears throat> Dudley largely serves her well, though there is at times where he does seem to be um, serving himself. The next one I've mentioned him already, uh, and the bit of the story behind him is Christopher Hatton. Um, he was a, a kind of very well educated man. He was a member of the gentry who studied, uh, studied the law and, and it, uh, at Oxford. Um, he played the part of the master of the game at a, at a mask, a masquerade ball, a form of entertainment, attracted the attention of Elizabeth. Uh, he was handsome. He was a good dancer. He won favour with the Queen. He was promoted to gentleman of the Privy Chamber and captain of the Queen's bodyguard. So I've already mentioned that the, the court doesn't quite work as it normally would do. Gentleman of the Privy Chamber would be more significant um, a, a title in, a, a, if there was a king. But captain of the Queen's bodyguard is very important. Um, there were, again, just like there were rumours about the Queen and Dudley, there were rumours about the Queen and Hatton. Uh, the rumours that were specifically made against the Queen in 1584 by Mary, Queen of Scots. Hatton was elected as a member of Parliament in 1571 and essentially managed Parliament on behalf of the Crown. Um, in 1581, he was appointed to help arrange the marriage uh, between the Queen and Francois, Duke of uh, Alacant, her little frog, the, uh, the Duke of Anjou. Uh, although um, he urged the Queen against the marriage, but again we can see his importance here in terms of um, helping arrange it. He was a member of the Law Court that tried Anthony Babington in 1586. He was one of the commissioners who found Mary Queen of Scots guilty of treason in, in 1587. Uh, in 1587 he became uh, Lord Chancellor and then he died in 1591. So again we can see 
and, and in kind of 30 years here of, of, of service um, from from Hatton uh, to Elizabeth. And again, we, we these are the, kind of the, the the big three kind of almost ever presence really are, are William Cecil, Robert Dudley, and Christopher Hatton. He plays a, an important role in government. He, he plays an important role in, in marriage negotiation. He, he plays a, a role in the handling of Mary Queen of Scots. There are also all the rumours. Again, Hatton seems to prove himself as a, a very, very capable um, a member of government and, and a, very, a loyal servant to Elizabeth. Uh, again, we, it depends on how much you look into some of the things we'll look at a bit later in terms of things like the Puritan choir to, to how good a job you, you think Hatton is doing in terms of controlling Parliament. Another long term minister and really important figure in Elizabeth's um, time in office is um, Francis Walsingham. He, he came from a family that had served um, the Tudor family uh, before. Um, he, he had fled during the, the, the reign of um, reign of Mary following the death of, of Edward. And then he returned when Elizabeth uh, took the throne, kind of very much a, a key a, a key uh, voice for Protestantism and Puritanism and uh, advocate for uh, interaction with the um, Protestants around uh, around other parts of Europe. He became a member of Parliament in 59. Uh, by 69, he was working with Cecil to counteract all the plots against Elizabeth. He's often referred to as Elizabeth's spymaster or the spymaster general. And he, his work would uncover a whole array of further plots, including the Babington plot, which triggered the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1570, he became ambassador in Paris. Uh, one of his duties to was uh, was to negotiate uh, the marriage between uh, the Duke of Anjou um, uh, and again then substituted in for the Duke of Alcoran uh, and, and he, he he doesn't necessarily go in the greatest faith and he, he considered um, him to be um, ugly and, be, and void of good humour but but again, he, he's trying to negotiate these to improve the relations with France. Um, he's made a member of the Privy Council. He made Joint Secretary of State with Sir Thomas Smith, uh, and then he was in charge of the Civi, um, Civi, the Privy Seal following Smith's retirement in 1576. Um, he he was knighted, knighted in 1577 and died in 1590. So. His big involvement is the, the role in covering plots. And in that, you can see that he serves Elizabeth well. He helps keep her safe, um, which is really important. He helps um, her, pr promote her position on the international stage and improve international relations in the 1570s, which is enormously important. So whilst Elizabeth was able to use marriage and things very, very effectively in the 1560s and the 1570s into the 1580s, when these things are becoming more difficult, then we see Walsingham. Um, playing an important role. Again, we don't think he was completely in line with Elizabeth religiously, but overall, again, I would say that he largely served her well. We then move into the this kind of the second generation, and I, I often think of it kind of Elizabeth's reign in two parts. And you, you've got these ministers in the, from from the early stage of her reign that last a very long time who are fiercely loyal to her. I, I would say argue on the whole, though there are some pitfalls in it, but on the whole, do a good job of serving Elizabeth. And then the ministers that come later, the sons of the elder statesmen, tend to serve themselves rather than serving Elizabeth. Um, now, the first of these is the son of William Cecil, Robert Cecil, and my pygmy, as he was referred to um, rather cruelly by Elizabeth. Um, and, uh, and then and my little beagle, as he was called by James I. So he was elected as a member of Parliament in 1584, um, and though he didn't actually speak in Parliament until 1593, uh, and was uh, appointed as a privy councillor. Uh, after the death of Walsingham in 1590, he, he um, 
took on a increasing heavy workload um, it, under his father. Uh, he was knighted and appointed the Privy Council, uh, Secretary of State in, in 1589, though his formal appointment came, came later. He participated in the social life of the royal court. Um, and there's a bit about him going, going and catching, hawk, going hawking with the, the Queen and catching partridge, uh, uh, partridges. He was never fully trusted by the Queen in the way that she trusted his father. She she always felt that his interests were not completely aligned with hers. Uh, there's a significant factional rivalry between him and Robert, Robert Dovereux, the Earl of Essex. What Robert Cecil was very good at was building a, a kind of a, a, a faction around himself that protected him uh, and made sure that he kind of succeeded and Essex failed. Um, if we're to believe Essex, then Cecil really was pulling all the strings and essentially running government towards the end. And he, he kind of <coughs> he, he, he was the, the main focus of Essex's anger. And Essex's desire was to, to remove Robert Cecil from his position. Um, and again, Sussex, Essex aimed to, to kind of impeach Cecil and throw him out. Uh, it was Cecil, ultimately, he was able to orchestrate the smooth uh, succession of James I. But in this, we can see a, a degree of disloyalty in that, that Cecil was told not to, to kind of work with James by Elizabeth, but continued to do so um, secretly. So maybe he served the realm quite well because there was a smooth succession at the end of the Tudors, but I don't think he, he, his primary focus of loyalty was Elizabeth, very much unlike his father, but a, undoubtedly a very, very able and clever politician. His great rival was Robert Dothero, the Earl of Essex. He was the stepson of Robert Dudley, uh, so the son, the son of Walter Dothero and Robert Dudley's second wife, uh, Lettuce Nollies. Um, his um, maternal uh, great grandmother was uh, Mary Boleyn, the um, sister of Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother. Um, so he'd served, he'd, he made his reputation in terms of military service. Um, he'd served under his stepfather in the Netherlands before making an impact at court and winning the, the Queen's favour. Um, so he, and he very quickly, very kind of dashing and attractive young man became very close, very soon one of the Queen's favourites. Uh, he was given uh, uh, Leicester's um, royal monopoly on sweet wines following his death, and which made him a kind of a lot of revenue. He married Sir Francis Walsingham's daughter uh, in 1590. In 93, he was a member, made a member of the Privy Council. He was hot-headed, uh, and he, he, he seemed to want to compliment and flatter the Queen, but consistently underestimated her. Um, there was a, a, a kind of big signs that he kind of showed a complete lack of respect. Uh, and one occasion, a heated Privy Council debate on the problems in Ireland, the Queen uh, uh, reportedly cuffed him round the ear, uh, prompting him to uh, half draw his sword on her. Not a euphemism, I'm told. Uh, and and what we, we see with that, again, the, much the horror of those around him. So clear evidence that maybe Essex doesn't serve the Queen well in the way that the earlier um, early ministers had, and definitely doesn't show the absolute devotion that his stepfather uh, Dudley showed. He, he took part in Francis Drake's English Armada attack on, on, um, on Spain, though the Queen had ordered him not to take part. In 1596, he distinguished himself by the capture of Cadiz, though often with his interventions in um, at sea, he, he looked more to profit than he did to um, to actually secure the, the best possible strategic outcome for Elizabeth. Uh, he he showed it again when when it, and a voyage to the, the Azores in 1597 how how he was willing to defy the Queen's orders and and put um, Spanish treasure ahead, gaining Spanish treasure ahead of defeating the Spanish fleet. His biggest failings, however, came when he was made Lord Lieutenant in Ireland. Rather than face seal of Tyrone in battle, he he entered a, a truce that was considered to be a humiliation to the crown. He then 
sailed back to London explicitly against the Queen's orders. He knighted a lot of his men explicitly against the Queen's orders. She'd been so frustrated with his lack of progress in Ireland. He then unexpectedly appears back in England, bursts into a bedchamber in Nonsuch Palace before she was properly wigged and gowned to kind of great um, horror and, dis and, and, and show of disrespect. Um, he was tried in front of a commission of 18 men, um, which went on for many hours during which he had to kind of kneel in, in a sign of penance. Um, he was deprived of public office. Um, eventually he was given, in August he was given his, his freedom, but the source of his basic income, the, the monopoly on sweet wines, was, was not renewed. He, his situation became desperate um, and he became more and more enraged and decided to uh, take, uh, take methods into his own hands and he rebelled. We had the Essex Rebellion in 1601, uh, aiming to, to essentially really get rid of Cecil, but also to put himself in, in a position where he would take over the running uh, of England. Uh, the rebellion ultimately failed and Essex was executed. But it is quite clear to say that, that Devereux does not serve Elizabeth well. He is not loyal. He do, does not follow her orders. He does not have her her, her kind of best interests at heart. He, he's out for himself. Uh, and uh, it, it, no clearer indication than rebellion itself. So really, we've seen Elizabeth early on and for a very, very long period of her reign, being very, very well served by her ministers. The new generation that come through, far less loyal, serve her far less well uh, and concentrating on their factional rivalry between each other rather than on focusing on doing a good job for Elizabeth. The next section I'm going to look at is Parliament. Uh, and one of the big questions we have to ask ourselves about Parliament uh, uh, in Elizabethan England is, is, was there this Puritan choir, this powerful Puritan choir that Sir John Neill writes about? Um, now, Neill argues that the Queen was conscious of a, a dangerous international situation when she made a religious settlement. So she simply wanted to gain parliamentary confirmation for her royal supremacy and parliamentary um, confirmation would then be enough and then she would dissolve Parliament. In March 59, the international situation improved and Elizabeth let Parliament reassemble. Um, however, the clergymen in the House of Commons and their allies, with Neil calls the Puritan Choir, started then pressurising Elizabeth into a much more Protestant prayer book than she had wanted. And Neil suggests, in particularly then in 63-66, the Puritan Choir emerges as being incredibly powerful with about 40 MPs. And he then tells the story of the relationship between Parliament and Elizabeth as, as being one of conflict, not only over uh, religious matters, um, but over over other issues as well. So in, in religious uh, in ones, we see, for example, Whitgift's actions against the Puritan preachers in 84. We see the issue of free speech being raised, often linked with religion, but the issue of free speech. We see Wentworth being imprisoned for him pushing on this issue in 1576. And we see Parliament taking on Elizabeth over monopolies in 1601. So we've got this kind of wide ranging set of examples. But the, the real the thrust of this is that what, what we see is Parliament and monarch in a form of conflict. Now, to me, what Neil is doing, he's telling the story of the rise of Parliament. He, he's trying to get to the point that we would then see 40, 40 50 odd years later when we, we're going to see Parliament and the monarchy um, at each other's throat and we're going to see the English Civil War. He points to the fact that in 1603 over half of the MPs had university degree or were trained lawyers uh, and what he wants to do is, is give the background to the, the English Civil War and the, the rise of Parliament and the conflict with Charles I. Um, but many, including myself, are not convinced this is an accurate picture of Elizabethan parliaments. And, and much of the more modern writing it kind of tells a very different story. Um, even stuff, if we go back into the 60s and 70s, stuff like the likes of Elton and Graves would, would point, point to a far more harmonious relationship um, between Elizabeth and her parliaments, where conflict was um, limited and infrequent. Uh, and they would also argue that there was there was not a united and powerful Puritan choir. 
Um, Elizabeth pointing out that Elizabeth did not change a religious settlement in line with Puritan ideas and resisted any encroachment into her prerogative powers. Um, they would point to the fact that it was the Lords, not the Commons, that was generally considered to be the more powerful house at this point in time, particularly as, as many MPs in the, in the House of Commons were nominated by members of the House of Lords and would owe, owe kind of a degree of patronage and loyalty to those Lords who'd appointed them. Um, and the ministers uh, influenced the two houses, notably William Cecil, but also um, Hatton, as we still saw earlier. There were rebellious MPs like Wentworth, but they were the exception, not the rule. And generally, Parliament did as Elizabeth wanted, especially regarding money. Parliaments were, on average, quite short, about 10 weeks, and infrequent, there's about 13 of them. So, and they were largely just completing um, mundane work. So there is an argument about the power of Parliament during Elizabeth's reign and how harmonious the relationship was. And both of those are things that you could be asked about. So I'm going to whiz through um, some of Elizabeth's parliaments and again, focusing on this idea about whether she was able to control them, whether she had a harmonious uh, relationship with them or one of conflict. So the first of her parliaments in 59 is to do with the religious settlement. Um, the settlement passed, and it, I think it's worth noting, this is largely with Protestant support. In fact, the real opposition to the settlement came from the Catholics in the House of Lords, and we see a number of um, Catholic bishops actually being um, locked up and prevented from voting. This is hugely significant as it sets up um, the form of worship uh, for Elizabeth's term in office, a time, in, a time uh, as monarch, and this is this is the bit that sets up the church. Now there is an argument about whether she gets exactly what she wants, and I would say that she did. Uh, and Neil then starts talking about this kind of rise of the Puritan choir that comes later, which I'm not fully convinced of. We get uh, another parliament in 63, so which is, is largely about money. And, and during this period, 63, 67, um, MPs were marrying Elizabeth to marry. Remember, this follows on from the crisis of 62. Um, they are interfering with her prerogative powers. She does fight back against it. Um, and Elizabeth vetoes, she prevents the passage of a bill with further religious reforms in it. Um, which had been favoured by many, including ministers like Cecil. So again, we talked earlier about whether she was well served by Cecil. We, and I talked about there are religious disagreements between them. Um, so we do see a degree of um, difference of opinion between MPs and the Queen about pro royal prerogative powers, about religion to an extent. Elizabeth gets what she wants, which is money. She gets what she wants, as in she she doesn't stand for people interfering in her prerogative powers. She maintains the, the, the religious settlement, which she liked as it was, as it was. So Elizabeth essentially comes out on top on this. Um, it can be shown as a, a degree of conflict, but I, I think it's important not to overstate that in terms of what was happening. In 71, again, um, we want we see uh, Elizabeth um, in need of some money. Um, we see the tightening of um, the treason laws against Catholics, uh, and uh, we we see uh, we 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 see all that going smoothly. So in this Parliament, Elizabeth are on board with each other. Um, one bit we see that we, we, we see a degree of conflict is William Strickland proposed a, a bill to reform the Common Book of Prayer. This upset the Queen. Again, this goes back to the idea that the Queen believed that her settlement was the correct one. Um, and again, we, we see Strickland being kicked, kind of kicked out of the House of Commons. In, in 72, the big issue at the time is, is uh, the issue of security following the Rodolfi plot. Um, Parliament wants uh, Norfolk and Mary Queen of Scots um, to be executed. Um, and essentially, although Norfolk ultimately is, is, is executed, Mary Queen of Scots isn't at this point in time. And again, Elizabeth pushes back, kind of going, right, yes, you, you are showing concern for me. Yes, you are. You, you, kind of, you, you want me to do these things, but I, I will make these decisions. This stuff is up to me. Um, in 76, she asks for more money. She grant, gets the money. 
we we see Wentworth being imprisoned for infringement of royal prerogative in 81. Again, very similar stuff. We see a subsidy being granted uh, and we see a tightening of, uh, of anti-Catholic laws. So if we look at 76 and 81 in particular, then what we've got is is largely Parliament harmonious with Elizabeth. They want the, the anti-Catholic laws um, to be tightened. They're granting her the subsidies that she want. And we see maybe Wentworth as, a, as a, an outrider in here. We've got another outrider earlier in 71 in Strickland. But most of Parliament is, is, is very much on board with Elizabeth. And what they're mainly concerned for is, is, is for her personal safety. 8485, we see the, the difficult international relations following the assassination of William uh, of Orange. Again, the Catholic laws, uh, anti-Catholic laws are tightened. Uh, and we see the acts for surety of the Queen's person, which can give a, a statutory basis to the bond of association that had already been agreed. And this, this shows a degree of uncertainty at the time, but this doesn't suggest a parliament in conflict uh, with the monarch. Uh, 86, 87, again, we see the difficult international situations following the, the Babington plot. Um, there's a parliamentary debate on, on the pros and cons of executing Mary Queens of Scots. Um, now, Elizabeth had sought advice on, on from Parliament on Mary Queen of Scots. So again, we can see this as, as power of Parliament, but also um, Parliament working harmoniously with Elizabeth. There were Presbyterian MPs who sought religious reforms and were imprisoned for infringement of the royal prerogative. So we do see radical Protestant opposition to Elizabeth. We see her dealing with it. So there is some conflict there, but it is a small group. Elizabeth again comes out on top. 89, we need, she needed revenue for the war against the Spanish um, <clears throat> and Parliament voted a double subsidy. Um, and what, what we see here is, a, again, a much more positive uh, atmosphere in Parliament following the defeat of the Armada. And again, it really starts killing off any kind of thought of, of further religious reforms. Um, 93, we um, see some legislation against those who refuse to attend church, triple subsidy from Parliament. Wentworth again, we see as this outrider, he, he's imprisoned again for raising the issue of succession, infringing on royal prerogative. Um, 97, 98, Elizabeth again, short of money, there's an economic and social crisis. And here we see the really important legislation in terms of the poor law. Uh, and we, we see again, a triple subsidy granted by Parliament. Um, the issues of monopolies was also um, highly uh, debated at this point. Uh, and, and again, here we can see um, some conflict between Elizabeth and her parliament. 1601, Elizabeth remained short of, uh, of cash. Um, and, and we see the rev revision of the, the poor law of, of 1598. But also we, we see the golden speech here um, where Elizabeth again can win Parliament round. She can get a, get them on side. She can get them on board. And and although there is much moaning about monopolies and, and some other issues, Parliament grants her a quadruple subsidy. So it, there are, there is obviously an issue between Elizabeth and Parliament here, and hence the need for the Golden Speech. But the Golden Speech we can see is overcoming many of those issues. Finally, I want to look at and that is factional rivalries. I mentioned some of this stuff already. Um, there was limited patronage in the time of Elizabeth. Um, factions formed around powerful patrons who had access to, to Elizabeth. Um, then the faction members would be uh, clients of the patron. Um, and we would see them acting as, uh, as informers, supporters of the patron. In return, um, they would obtain patronage from um, the, the person above. So, for example, you might surround, you might go, well, Dudley's definitely in with the Queen. He's, a, he's her, her key favourite. We will align ourselves with Dudley and be part of his faction. And then he, as he's given granted favours, then that will spread down through us. Or we think Robert Cecil's in the right place to, to kind of <clears throat> see out the smooth succession of James I or align ourselves with Robert Cecil. Uh, and, and he'll be the man who gets things done and then we'll be in a strong position in things going forward. Early on, there are factions around uh, Dudley and Norfolk. 
So Norfolk, the only Duke at the time, sees Dudley as this kind of upstart uh, who, who's gaining far more favour than he should. Uh, we see the two groups um, wearing different coloured ribbons to show signify their loyalty. I think one's yellow and the other's purple, if I remember rightly. And we, we see them kind of strutting around, um, uh, strutting around court. Factions would seek the ear of the monarch, patronage, fruits of office, prominent men, so Dudley, Earl of Leicester, um, Cecil, uh, Lord Burley, the Earl of Salisbury, the Duke of Buckingham later, they all had access to and, and would attract clients. And so they, they would have, it's, it's a bit like a political party, not really, they don't have, but it's more about the leadership rather than a, a set of policies or anything like that. Um, there's a debate to the extent to which there was a, a, a factional rivalry between Dudley and Cecil. The only, arguably the only real issue they disagreed with was over marriage. I mean, they both agreed that Elizabeth should marry. It's just Dudley, at least for part of this period, seems to think that the person she should marry should be him, um, whilst Cecil believed that Dudley was completely beneath Elizabeth and she it would be too big a scandal and she absolutely shouldn't. Um, but in issues like foreign policy and religion, we can see Cecil and Dudley are, are quite like-minded. They're quite different characters, uh, and I think maybe that's why why some of the ideas of, of this rivalry and clash between them is picked up on. Now, <clears throat> sometimes one faction was able to to dominate, not necessarily monopolise patronage, and then then they would one one faction look to topple another. Um, and sometimes we see personal animosity, like we saw between Norfolk and Dudley. Um, we, the best example uh, of, of problems caused with factional rivalry is that between Robert Cecil and Robert Dovereux, the Earl of Essex. Uh, and Robert Cecil builds up a kind of um, network of clients uh, and supporters far more effectively than Essex does, uses patronage far more cleverly. Um, and they, again, both Essex and, and Cecil were arguably more likely to resort to deceitful and corrupt practices than the than the, their kind of predecessors as they, as they fought for favour. Um, and and the, the the whole kind of part of this was. was the, the kind of the need to fight over what little bits there were because there wasn't an enormous amount of wealth and patronage going around because of the cost of the war and things like that. So, and Elizabeth didn't like spending money, so she didn't like giving out patronage. And Robert Cecil comes out on top of this. We see Essex kind of shoved in, shoved out into the cold and then he rebels. Um, so here, we this, with the Essex Cecil. Um, rivalry is the one that we, we see that has the really big consequences. Other than that, it seems to be that, that something that Elizabeth felt that she was on top of, that she could she could manage. These were people competing for her favour. That's essentially how the system worked. And, and, it's, and it's, it's, there are bits where you say she, she gets things wrong. So you could say that, that, again, Norfolk might not have been pushed into the hands of the rebellious Northern Earls if, if she dealt with Norfolk better at court. Um, the the other elements again it, it, is Dudley given too much power and position um, Hatton again, but they seem to serve her pretty well. Uh, William Cecil is enormously powerful at the centre of her government. He is manipulating some in Parliament to talk against about some of her religious policies and try and get think more radical Protestant changes in there. So he, in that, we, we can see that faction there. But Cecil was overwhelmingly loyal to the Queen, uh, William Cecil, and therefore a William Cecil faction is not a threat to Elizabeth. Whilst the Robert Cecil threat, the Robert Cecil Earl of Essex rivalry possibly was a threat. And so that's maybe one of the differences towards the end of her reign. I hope that's been um, helpful for you. Lots of stuff to think about. Uh, the main things to pull out is, is, is that, well, what kind of questions could they ask you? Well, they can ask you about how well she's served by ministers, how good a job the ministers do, how effective government is under her. Um, they could ask you about interaction with parliament. Is, is it harmonious? Is it one of conflict? Is the, this, this Puritan choir causing her massive problems all the way through? Uh, how does the, how, how um, well, does Elizabeth manage things like the court?
uh, th does she do a good job in managing the people around her and government as a whole? So lots of interesting stuff in there. I hope it's been helpful to you. If it has, then please hit like. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And if you haven't already subscribed to Alan History Nerd, please do. There's a whole series of videos covering this A-level history topic and numerous other ones, as well as lots and lots of videos covering the whole of the A-level politics aspect that we teach. Thank you very much for watching.